for a cardiac surgeon to come to Georgia Tech to talk about tissue and cell engineering is a little bit like taking coal to Newcastle. But I do appreciate the opportunity. Uh, understand that I'm going to bring to you the perspective of a clinical surgeon. My area of surgery is reconstructive cardiac surgery, uh, rebuilding the heart, replacing the heart, closing holes in the septums, uh, repairing valves. So we use a wide variety of materials. And in fact, with any given situation, uh, we may use Dacron, we may use uh, PTFE, uh, we may use patient's own tissues, uh, we may use cryopreserved homograph tissue, uh, Gore-Tex, uh, you name it, we have a whole panoply of materials, just like an artist would have their materials, and we match the performance characteristics of those materials to what we wanted to do in the reconstruction. And none of these materials are perfect. So what I'm going to tell you uh, about today is a little bit of my odyssey in the area of valve uh, replacement and valve reconstruction, and starting off a little bit with, uh, with the real clinical uh, challenges that we face as surgeons. This is the so-called learning tree outside the uh, uh, medical school at Brown University. Uh, the seed for this tree came from the hill uh, on which the tree stood under which Hippocrates taught his pupils and by various works of art they've determined that this is in fact the species so supposedly this is a direct descendant of Hippocrates uh, plantus orientalis which is a, uh, a uh, uh, relative to the sycamore. Now when we talk about replacing the uh, valves in a heart whether it's a child or an adult we have a number of options today. We can always repair the valve, or we always have the option of repairing the valve, and when we can repair the valve and leave the patient with a well-functioning valve with their own material, that is always our first option. But in most cases, in fact, repair is not an option because either the valve's not there to start with, as in congenital heart disease, or the valve is so badly damaged, as in acquired adult uh, cardiac disease, that some replacement is necessary. In today's world, these are the replacements that we currently have available. We have mechanical valves, of which I'll show you one in a minute, uh, which has a number of advantages. Uh, it's manufactured. It is manufactured to specific tolerances. Every time you open the package, it's exactly the same. If it's a 23 valve, it's always a 23 valve. Uh, it has excellent durability today. Uh, most of them are now made out of uh, pyrolytic carbon, uh, are relatively non-thrombogenic, although thromboembolism and the need for anticoagulation remains a problem. It's a very reproducible valve, but it does have some problems I'll talk about in a minute. The xenograft manufactured valves are primarily porcine. The tissue is treated with glutaraldehyde, which cross-links all of the collagen, makes it a very stiff, very firm, easy to handle valve, easy to suture valve. They can be on stents or they can be so-called unstented valves. The unstented valves is basically the aortic root of a pig chopped out, given to us after being glutaraldehyde treated, and then we sew it in in place of the patient's root. Glutaraldehyde also has the other advantage of being extraordinarily toxic and kills all viruses, bacteria, etc. There are manufactured valves out of cow pericardium, once again treated with glutaraldehyde, and once again they are on stents. They have the advantage of the hemodynamics can be optimized by the way you sew the valve leaflets onto the stent. And so in fact, bovine pericardial valves are actually a little bit better in terms of their hydraulic performance, their mechanical engineering characteristics, than the porcine valve, which is intact from the pig aortic root. Then we have a whole group of homographs. The most commonly available homograft, homologous meaning transplant from one human to another, is a so-called cryopreserved homograft. These are obtained from multiple organ donor harvests in which the heart is not useful for a whole heart transplant, and so the valves are chopped out uh, carefully, uh, then uh, prepared with antibiotics, uh, cryopreserved and, uh, after sizing, and then are kept in liquid nitrogen until we use them. Now, in the history of homographs, uh, this actually goes back to 1962, when the first aortic valve was uh, homograph was sewn in, and that was a fresh one. Uh, as the story goes, uh, uh, Donald Ross uh, was operating on a woman in London, uh, 
uh, young woman who had rheumatic heart disease, and he was decalcifying her aortic valve. Uh, at that time, remember that the Star Edwards valve had just been invented in 1960, was not yet available in England, was not, had not been manufactured in England, was not available. This young woman's aortic valve disappeared up into the sucker, and he was looking into her aortic root with no valve in sight. And of course, she was essentially dead at that point. He sent his resident in England called a, a, a registrar down to the morgue where they cut a, a aortic valve out of the only available cadaver there. He sewed it into the patient. And when I was in London in 1984, some 22 years later, she was still alive. She'd had three kids. And uh, he took her to many of the lectures that he gave around. <laughs> Then uh, the problem, of course, with fresh homographs is that you don't always have the right stiff hanging around that you need. And the harvesting and the quality control and the bacteriology and all of those things are, would be overwhelming. So what Donald Ross did was every Christmas he went all over London to every autopsy room in London and gave a case of scotch to the deaner. And then he would send his technicians around the rest of the year, and they would harvest aortic valves from all of the cadavers that came through those autopsy suites. They'd put them in antibiotics, then they'd put them in tissue culture medium, and they'd bring them to Donald Ross's laboratory uh, at, the, uh, at the cardiac hospital, where they would stay in the refrigerator until they became contaminated, at which time they'd be thrown out, or if they were needed, they'd be sewn in a child or an adult. And that's called the so-called wet stored uh, valves. And once again, very cheap, costs a case of scotch a year to, uh, to get them. But once again, quality control, a little difficult. Decellularized homographs we're going to talk a lot about. And uh, the decellularized xenograft, uh, some of you in the field uh, may be aware of the centograft story. Uh, decellularized uh, uh, pig valves have been tried and the experiment has been tried in humans and the experiment failed. This is a, the most commonly used uh, mechanical valve today. It's a bi-leaflet design, pyrolytic carbon. This is a St. Jude. There are two or three other companies that make similar valves. This is a standard first generation porcine xenograft. You can see the three leaflets and you can see that they are sewn to the sewing ring. This area where the pliable leaflets are sewn to the rigid sewing ring is the area of difficulty for this valve. This is where all the stress, flexion stress occurs. This is where the calcification occurs. This is where the ruptures and the tears occur. And this is where this valve fails. The other way the tissue valve fails is with gradual uh, calcification, fibrosis, and stiffening as the body uh, responds to this foreign uh, object. Uh, with inflammation. Here you can see holes, calcium, very rigid valve. These are valves we've taken out of patients and had to replace. The life of a pig valve, a stented pig valve in a child because of the revved up calcium metabolism can be as short as two years. In a young adult it can be as short as eight to ten years. In somebody over the age of 65 it may be as long as 15 years. So as surgeons, we replace one disease with another disease. We replace valvular heart disease with prosthetic valve disease. Prosthetic valve disease uh, is a consequence uh, and has varying components as a consequence of which prosthesis we choose. They can be more thrombogenic and therefore we have to anticoagulate the patient. Not a good thing for a six-year-old kid. Anybody here who's a parent and has seen six to ten-year-old kids run around and play on the playground know that being anticoagulated is not a good thing for a child that age. All valves manufactured by anybody else other than God has hydraulic dysfunction inherent. The valves do not work as well as the original equipment. There are always gradients, there's always areas of turbulence, there's always resistance, and that can change over time. Hemodynamic performance is what we refer to in terms of how well does it adapt to the workload of the heart. And is, is it the right size for the patient? Is it obstructive? Does it, prevent, or does it cause so much obstruction that the heart has to increase its muscle, in other words, hypertrophy? Uh, what is its actual hemodynamic performance? Size mismatch is a big deal in my area. 
if you're operating on a two-year-old child, you obviously cannot put an adult-sized valve in with these manufactured valves. Endocarditis, since turbulence is always a problem and these are unnatural materials, uh, manufactured materials, the risk of seeding the prosthesis with bacteria uh, or fungi is reasonable. And in fact, uh, there is a probably about a 15% chance over a 25-year life of a, of a valve that it will get involved with endocarditis. The valves can catastrophically fail. For example, a leaflet could flip off or tear, or it can fail over time with deterioration. And so we talk a lot clinically about the durability of the valve. Put yourself in the position of the patient. The patient comes in and says, gosh, I've got to undergo open heart surgery. How long is this going to last? That's our definition of durability. An engineering definition of durability would in fact be a whole lot more precise. Now I could spend an hour giving you um, uh, Kaplan-Meier curves of durability and patient outcomes with the various prostheses. And that's a little bit of a different talk, but this is the way surgeons think. We think in terms of these Kaplan-Meier performance curves. And here, for example, is a patient survival curve over six to eight years for a freestyle, or that's a stentless valve, and this is the root of an aorta from a pig sewn in to replace the aortic root of a patient versus that standard pig valve that I showed you a picture of. And interestingly enough, in this group of patients, and this is fairly representative of many trials, there begins to become a separation after about five to seven years where the unstented valve seems to uh, confer a certain survival advantage to the patient. This catches our attention as a clinician. The durability of this valve may be very good, but for some reason the patients are doing a bit better with this valve over time. We'll talk a little bit later and talk about why we think that may be true. Now homographs are the sort of the ultimate unstented valve. This is the aortic root of a human cut out. As I indicated, there's a so-called fresh fresh like Donald Ross's first one. There are the so-called fresh wet stored where they're uh, simply rinsed off in antibiotics and stored in tissue culture medium in the refrigerator. There is what um, Dr. Yacoub calls homo vital. And these are uh, valves that are harvested with the intent of maximizing viability. There was a, uh, an experiment with irradiated valves at the Mayo Clinic in the 70s in which they put in about 600 irradiated valves. The advantage of the irradiation was that uh, the valves were sterile. Uh, There's no risk of infection, whereas in all of these you can potentially transmit disease from the donor to the recipient. Unfortunately, they put in 600 and about three or four years later they took out 600 valves as they all calcified. Today we have two versions of the cryopreserved valve. I'll show you a little bit about cryopreservation in a minute. One is cryopreserved by a commercial uh, company for maximum viability. The other is cryopreserved by a not-for-profit organization for some viability. And we're entering the era of the decellularized and the tissue-engineered valves. This is a heart. See, it's just delivered to the tissue laboratory where a dissection has begun. It's harvested as a whole heart put on ice and like any other organ transplant is sent. Here is the aortic root from the patient, from the donor uh, that has been dissected. You can see a little bit of remaining muscle here, uh, which is important. It is impossible to prepare a whole aortic root without leaving some of the donor muscle attached. And I'll, more about that later. This is the anterior leaf of the mitral valve, which shares the fibrous skeleton along one third of the aortic uh, valve, which you see right here. This is the aorta, and this is the first branch vessel to the head and right arm. And this is normally uh, cleaned off a little bit, but what we get when we thaw. The, uh, the uh, homograft is prepared with DMSO, 10% step down, replace the water to make sure the cells don't lice, and then it's crowd preserved to minus 180 degrees and stored in liquid nitrogen until we thaw it out in the operating room. Now here is a, about a five-year study in which homographs were compared to the stentless xenographs, which I showed you compared to the 
uh, to the uh, tissue stented valve. And you can see here that at least in this series, and this had some younger patients, 90% um, of the patients are alive and doing well similarly between the two. And then if you look at um, centers that have gone back and forth between vi so-called viable allografts or homographs, I'll use those terms interchangeably, or with antibiotic sterilized, you can see that sort of the less you do to the homograph, it seems the better the homographs survive. And there's some reason for that. Uh, when you treat the homograph with antibiotics, there's a certain amount of cell death, cell necrosis. Cell necrosis is by definition pro-inflammatory, so that if you're leaving behind cell remnants in the carotid wall, you're going to generate an inflammatory response. And in the human body, the inflammatory response is always followed by scar formation and calcification. From a surgeon's standpoint, there's also some interesting lessons that we've learned over the last 20 years with homographs. And here's one of them. A root replacement seems to have a longer durability. We're now out now 15, 20 years in this particular series. Uh, it has a, this is uh, from uh, England, from uh, Dr. Yacoub's uh, group. The root replacement seems to do better than when you cut the valve out and implant the valve by itself. Well, that's kind of interesting. It, because if you think about it, now I'm sort of putting myself in your place as an engineer, when you put the root in, you're leaving the entire aortic root complex to function as it was originally intended. In other words, the annulus can dilate with each uh, systolic expansion, and the root can dilate, uh, as a matter of fact, and the valve leaflets in the whole aortic root complex functions as an entity. Whereas when you sew the leaflets in per se, you get fibrosis around the sewing points and the whole complex is not working as a unified uh, valve uh, structure. And therefore, that leads to ultimately tissue failure. Here, uh, you can also see that unlike manufactured valves, both the homograft and the freestyle actually drop their pressure gradient over time after implantation uh, and then it holds steady thereafter. Um, I didn't put the, uh, the slide in, but in fact over time all manufactured and stented valves actually increase their pressure gradients over time, increasing the load. And then in a real macro type of view, this is a, uh, a series that I put together oh, about 15 years, about 10 years ago in which I took uh, four or five kind of classic homograph series out of the literature from the 70s and 80s and compared them to mechanical and tissue valves, and this is just in children. And just grouping, throwing everything in together, uh, this used to be called a literature review, and I think it's now called a meta-analysis, you can see that there's a significant separation as you come out 10 years in terms of patient survival, and freedom from replacement of the valves. So for whatever reasons, these are working better than these over a longer period of time. This is the semilunar valve leaflet of an aortic valve. This is one third of an aortic valve. The next cusp uh, approximates here and the other cusp uh, approximates here to create the tri-leaflet design. Unlike the mitral and tricuspid valves, the semilunar valve is relatively passive uh, it does not have muscular attachments underneath the leaflet. There is some active uh, changes in the diameter of the aortic root complex itself, uh, but this is primarily a viscoelastic uh, uh, entity and responds passively to currents and changing pressure gradients. Now this is what I do for a living. I sew these things in and I make them fit into various size patients. And here is uh, one way of doing this. Here's the aortic root uh, from another human. Here we've opened the aortic root of a patient, uh, have cut out all of the obstructing tissue, and are simply sewing this down into the ventricular outflow tract of the patient. We then can do a number of things with everything above the valve. We can throw it all away and replace it as a root, taking the patient's coronary arteries and implanting them into the sinuses of the replacement valve, or 
we can keep part of the homograft and enlarge. We often do this in children who have hypoplastic aortas. Enlarge the aortic root with a piece of the homograft, but sew around the coronaries with this piece, leaving the patient's native tissue in over here and taking care to resuspend those semilunar valves that I showed that picture to you. And here's one, the so-called subcoronary implant in which we've opened the aortic root and sewn the patient's aortic valve or the homograft in place of the leaflets all around on the tri-leaflets, one, two, three, all around replacing the functioning part of the, va of the semilunar valve. As I told you, this probably isn't quite as good over a long term as replacing the entire aortic root. Why do we do this? This is Larry Dupuy, uh, who came to me when I was at Georgetown. He had uh, valvular heart disease at age 30. Uh, he had not graduated from high school. He was the winningest jockey on the West Virginia, Virginia circuit. He had a family and he needed his valve replaced. And obviously the textbook answer for a 30 year old would be a mechanical valve. It'll last longer than anything else, but he'll be taking anticoagulation, Coumadin. And he could never ride a horse again because these guys hit the dirt all the time. So we put a homograft into him and he sent me this picture a few years ago when he was winning. This is the finish line of his 3000th race. So not only are we saving lives with valve replacement, but we also have to be attentive to quality of life and matching the prosthetic valve qualities and in fact their poor qualities to the patient. So we often pick the valve that is the least obtrusive into the patient's uh, lifestyle. In terms of homographs, what are some of the advantages even as we use them today? One, the engineering design has clearly been proven. Two, the size matching with the patient, because this is soft tissue and not rigid, I can usually put an adult-sized homograft in any kid uh, that's larger than 15 kilograms. So by doing some tailoring and some nipping and tucking, we can usually get in an adult-sized or large valve to improve the hemodynamics. It is a viscoelastic replacement. It is not rigid. And anything rigid in the body has a problem. It has a problem with fatigue, wear, has a problem with causing fibrosis and uh, it's sterile inflammatory reactions. And as surgeons, we much prefer to work with tissue quality material. We like sewing tissue. I'm not, I, I dislike sewing Dacron, to be honest with you. It does make, because it's a very flexible material, it makes many of our very complex multi-level surgeries uh, much, much easier. Because it is viscoelastic, the afterload to the heart is actually reduced because during systolic ejection of the heart, the homograft conduit can actually dilate, functioning as a hydraulic capacitor, the valve closes, and then it contracts giving back some of the hydraulic energy. You have none of that, none of that in a fixed uh, stented prosthesis. It has the best hydraulic and hemodynamic function and for a number of reasons, probably more so this than the fact that it's human tissue. Uh, in other words, that there's less uh, problems with turbulence. There seems to be a markedly reduced endocarditis risk after a homograft implant. I mentioned to you how these are, are prepared. There are donor harvest, DMSO, uh, they're stored in liquid nitrogen. The way I got into this field was I was asking myself in the 80s, what is the best way to cryopreserve homographs? At that time, we kind of had the idea that maybe we should improve the viability of the myofibroblasts, the, the interstitial cells deep within the leaflets. We never wanted the endothelium to hang around because endothelium is very antigenic. So we did a series of experiments looking at ATP retention throughout uh, all the steps of cryopreservation. And to make a long story short, cryopreservation is pretty tough on the cells. Uh, they're pretty much depleted of intermediate metabolism, uh, uh, metabolites, uh, and they're, they're pretty, pretty hungry by the time you put them in. In addition to that, and this is some work that Steve Hilbert uh, did with us in the laboratory at Georgetown, most of these cells are essentially doomed and they've already uh, initiated apoptosis. So that in fact, by 
nine months after implantation of a homograft, virtually none of the cells that were living at the time of implantation are in fact alive. But what we did find was that you, these cells were pretty resilient. They definitely were alive when you put them in, maybe not very happy, but they were definitely alive. We defined the fact that these were myofibroblasts and not just fibroblasts. And we also felt that we've refuted the immune privilege. These cells are not immune privileged. They generate the same rejection phenomena that any other cell does. And I'll show you why we think, despite all of that, that uh, these homographs work so well. And this is actually a slide that Steve uh, Hilbert prepared with us uh, from a sheep, but we have many human uh, explants that look very similarly. This is a valve leaflet. And you can see there's just the occasional cell. And then you see the host sheathing, this fibrous sheathing or neoentima formation that in effect splints the valve leaflet. So what's happened with the homograft is it's become a mandrel. It's become um, a basis on which the, pa the patient has created a fibrous superstructure which now functions for a long period of time. And in fact prevents these few remaining uh, donor cells from really coming in contact with, macro, with white cells. So if you look at, uh, here's the tri classic tri-leaflet structure of the valve leaflet, and here you look at an allograft valve 30 days later, you're beginning to lose that trilaminar look, and you're seeing uh, very few cells uh, remaining. What are the disadvantages of homographs? Well, they are antigenic. Uh, this has been clearly shown. They generate panel reactive antibody responses, um, and the more mismatched they are, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the worse they do. And in fact, a very interesting study was done comparing homograft implants, in which we do not give uh, uh, anti rejection drugs, with whole heart transplants. The valves from a whole heart transplant, in which the patient re receives anti rejection therapy, look normal, whereas all the homograft transplants look like those pictures I showed you. Well, why did I do so well? <laughs> so let's learn, uh, what, what do we, as we enter the tissue engineering era, what do we need to not lose from the homographs? Well, we still use them every week. Well, first of all, the processing does strip the endothelium. The matrix is left variably intact, depending upon the processing, but even some of the soluble proteins remain. The myofibroblast, if you strip the endothelium and you strip out by le simply leaching some of the more superficial myofibroblasts, most are buried within the collagen. So except for that piece of muscle tissue that I showed you, these cells, to a certain extent, are in fact, there's a physical barrier uh, between ex being exposed to the, uh, to the recipient. This is, I think, and this once again comes from Steve Hilbert's work with us, this is critical. When you get rid, when you process in such a way that the cells are removed as opposed to being destroyed, then the cells leave by apoptosis and not cell necrosis. And apoptosis by definition is not inflammatory, they just disappear. Whereas if you destroy the cells, break them up and leave them behind, it's very, very inflammatory. The fiber sheathing uh, we talked about, the wall of the homographs almost always does calcify, makes sense, it revascularizes, there's more exposure of the donor cells uh, to a rejection phenomena. So the bioengineered personal valve. How do we make the step from homographs to engineering out the defects of the homograft without losing the advantages of the homograft valve transplants. Well, what do we want? What do I want? Uh, most of you are, are bio, bioengineers, all of you. Graduate students, how many graduate students? Any undergraduate engineers? Okay, so as graduate bioengineers, you're gonna come to me or I'm gonna come to you more likely and I'm gonna say, I want an ideal valve, make me one. And I'm going to tell you in surgeon speak what I want. And then you're going to translate that into engineering and mathematical language. And six weeks later, give me what I want. So what do I want? I want a valve that resists infection. 
I want a valve that can change its matrix to adapt to changing growth of the patient, to hypertension, and to other stresses. A valve does not stay, the valve you've got at age 12 is not the valve you've got when you're 40. And in fact, you take a pulmonary valve, which is a thin, diaphanous, very delicate looking valve, and you put it in the aortic position, and we actually do that in patients. Six months later, it looks like an aortic valve. It's thickened up, it's got more collagen, it's got more elastin, it's got more chondroitin sulfate. So I want something that dynamically remodels in both repair and growth modes. I want something that looks like a valve. And here's valve leaflets with the three layers of fibrosis, spongiosa, and ventricularis, upon which there's an endothelium on each side. Each layer is a little bit different. It's not constructed this way by accident. This gives the best bending stress parameters. The, it allows the stress of the movement of the leaflet to be dissipated across the entire leaflet, avoiding those flexion creases of the manufactured biological valves. There's a reason for all of this. So as much as I'd like to know those reasons, and we know some of them, more importantly, I'd say let's replicate it and then figure out why it's so good. A living valve replacement involves not just matrix, but also cells. We've done some work in our laboratory looking at various cell sources, and I know that all of those of you who are working with tissue engineering uh, know that there's a lot of different ways of doing this, anything from stem cells, circulating stem cells, embryonic stem cells. Um, there are fibroblasts everywhere. Is a dermal fibroblast as good as a fibroblast that comes, or a myofibroblast that comes from the heart itself? I have some biases about that based upon our work. But we've taken uh, fibroblasts from uh, many of them. We haven't done bone marrow yet, but we've done all these others and even have developed a way of biopsying the tricuspid valve that would be clinically useful and can then grow up the cells, as you see here, in tissue culture so that potentially if we're going to bioengineer your va heart valve for you in vitro, we could biopsy your tricuspid valve, then proliferate your cells, and then come back and seed them back into a construct. We've looked at uh, ways of separating the myofibroblasts and endothelial cells. We can do that pretty easily uh, just by uh, changing the media. And then we've tried to characterize these cells. In other words, what, how, how do I know that this is a valve leaflet myofibroblast as opposed to a uh, skin fibroblast? And uh, we, we do it with uh, a number of immunocytochemical stains. We use antivimentin, alpha smooth muscle actin, fibronectin, chondroitin sulfate, and then, of course, they, can't, they should not stain uh, for factor VIII, which would make it an endothelial cell. Let's talk about matrix. This is a valve leaflet in which all of the cells have been removed. And you see that trilaminar structure. And interesting enough, you see all the spaces left behind. This is not the same valve it started out to be. It looks like the same valve, minus the cells. But I can tell you it doesn't feel like the same valve. It doesn't sew like the same valve. And I'm going to show you that it doesn't exactly act like the same valve. But it's pretty neat that we can take out all the cells and leaving very little cell debris and still have an intact aortic valve in our hand. And this took about five years of work to get to this point. There are a number of ways of decellularizing. There are non-ionic detergents. There are anionic detergents. There's EDTA. And then there's simple just uh, fluid, just water washout with sterile water. What we ultimately found, and this is a whole other talk, but we found that what worked best for us, which is a little bit different than what's in the literature right now, is using an anionic detergent with uh, enzymes, RNAs and DNA enzymes, and then using a prolonged washout phase of about 24 hours, and then using an ion exchange column to remove the detergent, left us with the best valve uh, in terms of having essentially no debris. I say essentially, and I'll show you why I say essentially, um, and yet retaining the structure. We've tried the other uh, methods uh, in the literature, and they've always left out a step. And, uh, you're not allowed to do that in your patents, but you can do that in the peer-reviewed literature, because we've never been able to repeat the steps of some of these other groups around the country and get the same valve. 
Here's what a valve looks like that's been decellularized as a pulmonary valve. You can see that the leaflets look very nice and intact. And uh, then we said, okay, how do we know that cells like this kind of tissue? So in parallel with the work on decellularization, we started looking at a qualifying assay that we could do in vitro. Well, we call it our static seeding uh, qualification. Should, shouldn't say quantification. Should be qualification assay. What well, this is is sort of a combination assay. It's a little bit of a toxicity assay. It's an assay that asks, will cells in static tissue culture, I'm not talking about a bioreactor now, will the cells um, adhere? Will they migrate? And will they proliferate? And some of the materials that we have tried as scaffolding is the uh, submucosal smooth muscle uh, decellularized tissue from sheep, so-called SIS, the decellularized valve tissue, crop reserve valve tissue, fresh tissue, glutaraldehyde fixed pericardium, and then photooxidized, which is another way of cross-linking the, the uh, 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 collagen and pericardium. Our assay is a million uh, tricuspid valve cells from passage three that have been uh, amplified in, in culture, and we apply it every other day for three applications, and then uh, carry the, uh, the tissue culture out about another week. And the idea here is that we can test the materials, and then let's say we find a nice material, then we can work through a series of pretreatments, etc. cetera, um, and it would be a very much quicker than sewing this material into sheep. So this is what we call our patch studies for scaffold performance. Now as a surgeon, what do I offer that's a little different in our laboratory than what you can replicate or what's easy uh, for other laboratories to replicate? And one is that we can actually sew these in living animals and see how the animals do over time. That's a very important step, so-called chronic large animal implant studies. There's a reason why in the regulatory world that that is a regulatory requirement before you go with devices into humans. However, it's, it's inherently inefficient. It's expensive. You've got to keep the animal alive. You have to put them on a heart-lung machine. Um, you have to take care of them afterwards. Sheep, like many of the animals, require antibiotics for a long period of time, daily veterinary care. So anything that we can go back to the lab and do in vitro is very, very important in terms of qualifying assays before we go back to the sheep. So the process goes back and forth, and you'll see some examples of that. This is SIS material. I just put this up. Uh, this is a four-ply SIS, and you can see that the uh, cells are still there. And I'll show you some SIS slides. These got a little bit out of, out of order. This is photooxidized pericardium. Uh, which has been seeded with tricuspid valve leaflet myofibroblasts in our assay. You can see that there is essentially, in this particular photo, limited in migration. The cells do adhere. Anytime there's a defect, they'll find their way in. And they seem reasonably happy. On the SIS material, they don't seem quite so happy. They're rounded up. There's no in-migration at all. So SIS is sort of a less happy substrate than is the photooxidized pericardium. Now if you take the SIS and, and uh, treat it with trypsin, we've done this with trypsin collagenase, you can open the structure up and you can get the cells to migrate in. In other words, the pore size is larger. But the problem with that is it is now just like wet Kleenex and you could never sew it, so it's clinically irrelevant. Here's bovine pericardium, and here's what happens when cells get layered onto something that has glutaraldehyde in it. They don't go anywhere, and they look very rounded, very unhappy, very un-myofibroblast-like, no long cytoplasmic processes looking like they're trying to crawl into the uh, leaflet. Now, if you take a pulmonary artery, and here's one we call this devitalized, but it's decellularized, and then it's just freeze uh, vitrified, and then rethawed. Uh, this is a, a low magnification view of, a, of uh, the tissue with myofibroblasts. And you can see here that in the same conditions in vitro, you see myofibroblasts on the surface, but you see myofibroblasts beginning to crawl all through the matrix of the, uh, of the uh, scaffold material. And then here's uh, devitalized that's not been, um, that's not been uh, vitrified and you can see that there are cells beginning to come all the way through. And once again, this is in the one week 
in vitro preparation. So we can now take this to the surgical model and put this in a functioning position in sheep. And uh, am I going back? I'm going backwards. And this is what a pulmonary valve that's been devitalized looks like, but notice that there's still some muscle at the bottom. This is not the same as a piece of tissue like the patch in which we've cut it out here in which there are no residual cells. There is residual material here. We know that because we've developed a panel reactive antibody assay, a flow cytometry based uh, fluorescent antibody test that replicates the PRA assay that we use in humans. And we know that when we put these in sheep, we get a PRA antibody response. Uh, this is one of our fellows implanting the valve. This is what a pulmonary, a decellularized pulmonary valve looks like in the pulmonary outflow tract position. The head of the sheep is up here, uh, and the uh, heart is down here. Pulmonary arteries are up here. Head of the sheep is actually this way, oriented a little bit differently in a sheep than a human. And this is what uh, we wake these sheep up immediately after the surgery. That's one of the tricks to getting them to survive. We're up to about 95, 98% survival now. And then they grow, and boy, they grow like crazy. Over the 20 weeks, they'll grow from 20 uh, kilograms to 40 to 60 kilograms if the valve is functioning well. Uh, our right ventricular alpha tract model or pulmonary valve model, we sample at 10 weeks and at 20 weeks. We've done this with all of these kinds of materials so that we can compare. I'm only going to be showing you bits and pieces. We just don't have enough time. I'm going to come back to this slide in a minute, but this is a valve leaflet, and think about that valve leaflet that I showed you before of a homograph valve in which all the cells died and you got fiber sheathing. This is a decellularized valve. This valve looked like that valve that had all those spaces and all the cells were gone. And you see from the luminal side, from the wall, this is the hinge point of the valve leaflet, that you're seeing these valve leaflet cells streaming in, these myofibroblasts streaming in. But this is still relatively acellular. You're seeing some attempts at endothelialization here. But you see our old friend here, the fiber sheathing, just like the homographs. I think, Steve, you did this slide, didn't you? Isn't that one of your beautiful slides? This is an SIS material that we've implanted as a monocusp in the right ventricular alpha tract position. Here's our old friend, the sheath. Here's the SIS material without much happening, and yet where there's a large space, the, the fibroblasts will find their way in and begin to repopulate. And that's just a high power view of that. But SIS material in general, in vivo, now that we've gone now, we're in the sheep implant, explant studies, in general respond with inflammation and with fibroblast sheathing on the abluminal side, away from the lumen of the pulmonary artery, and on the luminal side. So you see this more organized neoenema formation, and then this sort of fibrotic response, and not much happening in the material. And I'd be pretty, uh, I would not be very optimistic that this material is going to replace uh, with uh, donor cells. And just another slide to show not much happening in the material itself, and just these spaces remaining and not filling up. That's, this is an area of cellularization and not filling up. And here's the area of sheath formation. Looks very much like the scar response that we see to almost anything that we put in the human body. So the SIS material is not recellularizing. It's not tissue engineering itself. It's being lined over by the body's own cells as almost any foreign body material would. And here's kind of a frightening slide in which you see the material beginning to delaminate and actually break apart. No cells in there supplying structural proteins. And all you see is this little sheathing along the leaflet edge on each side. And I'd be very worried that this thing is going to fall apart pretty soon. And just more and more slides of the same. Now back to our, our um, decellularized tissue. Here's what it looks like with cells. Here's what a leaflet looks like without cells. And here's what some of our first explants looked like uh, at the leaflet margin. We see some hemorrhage. Uh, 
and we see some fiber sheathing, but we also see some cellularization occurring. A little bit more about that. But again, with some of our early decellularization methodology, the tissue is, uh, was causing some clot formation, some, uh, some uh, in-migration of blood, some breaking apart, and some fiber sheath formation, and a little bit of cells coming in, but not exactly what you'd really want to see. Go back now with your mind. We're now looking at a different material. I'm going to come back to a new generation of decellularized material in a minute. This is a cryopreserved sheep pulmonary artery. This is not the leaflet. Now this is the wall. And this is just what it looks like when it's thawed. You can see there's cells all through this. So these are donor cells. This is what a typical cryopreserved piece of cardiovascular tissue looks like. You put it in to a sheep as a patch, in this case, into the pulmonary artery. I'm sorry, we put this one in the descending aorta. You see a big, thick pseudoenema formed. This is the lumen of the aorta. This is the outside here. You see an inflammatory response and fibrosis occurring here. And here's the original crowd preserved leaflet. It is devoid of cells and is gradually disappearing. This is not tissue engineering. This is scar formation. This is not recellularizing. This is a high-powered view of the same thing. Works. It doesn't blow out. Um, and the valve leaflets work. And you do see a little bit of, re of, of ingrowth of the fibroblasts here. But I wouldn't call that uh, uh, an engineered heart valve. Here it is at 20 weeks. And this is the lumen side. This is now in a pulmonary artery. It just Notice that the neoenema is a little bit less thick. Everybody remembers that the pulmonary arterial mean pressure is 15, and the aortic mean pressure is 80 or 90, and therefore the response to the hemodynamic stress is less in the pulmonary artery, so you get less uh, thick neoenema. But look what's happening out here where all that inflammation was occurring on the abluminal side. Now we're starting to see calcification, inflammation, and really sort of bad things happening. Now we come to a pulmonary artery which has been decellularized, and this is what it looks like. Here is the uh, luminal side, if you will, and the adventitial side of a patch that has been devitalized and then freeze-dried, and then we've um, rehydrated it before uh, sewing it in. And you see lots of voids where the cells were, and you see a lot of this kind of amorphous material remaining behind. And this is what it looks like after 10 weeks in the uh, descending aorta. Fiber sheathing, material is going away, fiber sheathing out here, but a lot less of that inflammation and no calcification. And here, when you get on high power, you see a lot more cells are already beginning to distribute themselves into this cryopreserved matrix. I'm sorry, uh, decellularized matrix where there were no donor cells. And here again, uh, at 10 weeks, a little higher power, a little different view. And here you can see that the material, particularly from the abluminal side, is beginning to repopulate with cells that look all the world like myofibroblasts. And here's one of the descending aorta. And again, you see a, a thicker fiber sheathing. You see the material beginning to disappear. And you see cells beginning to distribute through. Same thing again. At 20 weeks, the material, you begin to see the cells distribute all the way through. Once again, lumen side. This is one that was 20 weeks in the pulmonary artery. Uh, this is probably a more true, this is cut a little bit on angle. But the patch is beginning to disappear and is beginning to become recellularized. A little higher view to show the distribution of cells. And when we stain these for a smooth muscle actin, vimentin, fibronectin, and all those marker proteins for what we think is the phenotype of a myofibroblast, it lights up. So these are myofibroblasts and not macrophages and not lymphocytes. And here's one in which was crowd preserved first and then devitalized. And you say, well, why would you ever do that? Well, if you think about it, sitting around in liquid nitrogen freezers all over this country are about 20,000 crowd preserved heart valves that are getting ready to go out of date and be pitched into the garbage dump. If we could take those human valves that have been cryopreserved 
and take them through the processing of desalinization and recellerization, we could in fact probably recycle all of those valves. So one of my pleas, it's so far not been heard very well, but one of my pleas to the companies that control these valves is do not throw them out yet because some combination of these uh, techniques may in fact be able to salvage literally thousands of valves. What's one of the major problems with human tissue transplants or human organ transplants? It's availability. So anything we can do to maximize availability uh, would be important. And here's one of these. This is an artifact of, of uh, cutting here. Uh, but here's a cryopreserved, decellularized uh, patch uh, that was placed in the aorta for 10 weeks. And you see the cells beginning to distribute through minimally, but still there. 10 weeks and then 20 weeks, you see more and more of the cells coming through. None of these patches became aneurysmal or had any dimensional changes, so they, at least in the chronic implant model, were safe. This is MHC1 stains on fresh snap frozen tissue. Uh, this is normal PA and you can see positive uh, staining indicating uh, that uh, these are HLA positive uh, as one would expect. We did this because there's still a few people out there who believe that for some secret reason homograph valves are not antigenic. They certainly are. And here is a decellularized uh, valve leaflet. And actually these do, there are a few remnants that are not visible to light microscopy, but on, uh, on your monoclonal staining do, do, does show up uh, as positive for MHC uh, uh, 1 and 2. So there are still, even in the decellularization techniques that we, we're working with, um, still a few cell remnants behind that might cause mischief. Uh, we're starting to run out of time, but I do want to point out some interesting features and why you, you may have been asking, why do you put them in the aorta and the pulmonary artery and patches and leaflets? Why do you use so many different models? Well, we're asking slightly different questions. And the descending aortic model is interesting because if you recall, right above the heart, there is systolic closure. There's no diastolic flow in the aorta. The, in fact, the flow in the ascending aorta actually reverses at the end of systole and falls back towards the heart. So the valves snap shut. But when you put a semilunar valve in the descending aorta, there's continuous diastolic flow. So we have what we call the fluttering leaflet model. Now these leaflets aren't slamming open and shut. They're sitting in the bloodstream fluttering. Our question was, well, gee, if we're not stressing the valve, uh, what happens to the cells in the recellularization? Is there something different going on in this? And interestingly enough, they recellularize perhaps even better in the fluttering position than in the functioning position. Now why would that be? <laughs> We're not entirely sure, but I'm going to show you uh, some slides. Remember this one I showed you before? See where the cells begin to peter out? This is the wall. This is the hinge of the leaflet. The tip of the leaflet is somewhere out here. And these cells are having a hard time getting past this hinge point. So maybe it's just a physical block at the maximum point of bending. And here's a little bit further out in the right ventricular outflow tract model, which would be a working leaflet model. And you see that there's minimal uh, recellularization at 20 weeks. And here's the fluttering valve, and this is just past the hinge point, and you see these cells beginning to really flow in to the leaflet, so that maybe it's just a physical obstruction uh, a problem. Uh, here's one in the uh, descending aorta for 75 days. You see our old friend, the fibrous sheath, but you see some cells beginning to get out into the mid portion of the cusp that you never see in a crop preserved heart valve and you don't see uh, in the right ventricular alpha tract working position. So there is a race going on here between recellularization and fiber sheathing. Now, this is the issue for you engineers. Here's the root of an aorta sewn in to the pulmonary artery position, okay? An aortic root an aortic root in the low pressure side of the heart. The only thing is it's been decellularized, 
And what do we see? We see an aneurysm beginning to form. So the material properties, while we have biologically improved the homograph by decellularizing it, and we're now getting recellularization beginning to occur, there's a little bit of a race between the loss of the material properties and aneurysm formation and wall thinning and recellularization by the host. So right now, this is not something that would meet safety criteria for sewing into a human. Our, va our valve model is a functioning value. We do echocardiogram. How would you like to be a fellow in my lab doing echoes on sheep every week? But they do, and they do uh, excellent uh, echoes to document that these valve leaflets are moving and functioning. We do dimensions at implant and explant. We do the explant morphology, and we do uh, weekly panel reactive antibodies. As long as there's no muscle attached to the valve leaflet or to the valves, uh, we don't see a blip in panel reactive antibodies. Uh, if there's tissue left behind, we always see it, which validates it. One quick aside, we do have a mitral valve uh, model, uh, which uh, we have uh, uh, tested the SIS material. Here you see an explant morphology, and here's the valve that has been constructed. This is the native valve behind. This is the constructed papillary muscle. This is a native papillary muscle tucked behind. This also is a 20-week model. You can see where we've sewn in the papillary muscle here to the wall of the ventricle. The pledgets are outside. The suture kind of curls its way down from the leaflets that have been constructed up here down this neo-papillary muscle and then out the ventricle. As you can imagine, infl uh, inflammation accompanies all sutures. That's the way sutures heal. So this is calcification along that uh, reconstructed papillary muscle. You can see here, you can see a little bit of calcification occurring up there. So what do we know? Well, first of all, we know that it's feasible to decel to a biological endpoint. We know that we can get to a point there are essentially no cells in, a, in an intact semilunar valve. It still looks like a semilunar valve. It still functions. There are no remnants by H&E. There are some minimal cell debris by electron microscopy and by the MHC1 and 2 stains. We know that this material functions relatively well in our seeding qualification assay, not quantification assay, qualification assay, in comparison to other materials that we've tested that, that either perform horribly or perform exceedingly well. We've done a nude mice implant model that shows no calcification uh, when the material is decellularized. We've seen no calcification in decell truly decellularized material in the chronic implant studies. And we know that the decellularized material has minimal to absent PRA responses. We know that it recellularizes, and this is a very unscientific term, this is a surgeon's term, it recellularizes sort of okay right now. We, it sort of recellularizes. One of the challenges is how do we quantify that and how do we time it? We do feel, however, that it recellularizes in vivo with myofibroblasts, which is what we want, as opposed to fibroblasts. And we've also documented that there's minimal inflammatory responses. We do know that fiber sheathing does occur around this relatively inert material. We do know, and I didn't show you this, but reendothelialization does occur. It can be relatively confluent. It can also be patchy. Um, have we totally uh, restored the trilaminar valve cell tissue structure? Not yet. In some of the areas, in short segments, yes. However, the adequate biological D cell that we currently have come to clearly results in material strength safety uh, margins being very, very narrow or even exceeded. We see thinning, we see fraying, we see aneurysm formation. We see increased dimensions. I didn't show you this, but we do see frank aneurysmal dilatation in the descending aorta. What we do not and what we need to know is how do we accelerate recellularization in vitro and or in vivo? Do we use pre-implantation mechanical preconditioning or chemical or protein pretreatments? Do we need to optimize the cell seeding? In other words, are we taking the cells from the wrong place or are we treating them improperly? Can we cycle them with protein shock or whatever to make them better at adhering and migrating? All these experiments need to be done.
Can this be done better in a pulsatile bioreactor? A lot of the information that's come from the Georgia Tech laboratories here, from Dr. Niram and Dr. Yoganathian, would suggest that a pulsatile bioreactor would be very useful for accelerating in vitro recellularization. How do we enhance recellularization in vivo? Well, it's my bias that if we understand how to do it in vitro, we'll be able to direct it and improve it in vivo. Can we pretreat a decellularized aortic valve with attractants or signaling proteins, or do we seed it? Do we seed it? There's a one paper from a German uh, laboratory that in a bioreactor seeded some valve material. I don't think it was an intact valve. I think it was valve material. For six weeks, it took them to get the cells. Now, that's clinically very impractical. I guarantee you that nine out of 10 of those valves will get infected in the hospital environment if you actually tried to do that. So if we're going to see, do we do it the day of surgery? Do we do it a week ahead of time? Do we do it, uh, et cetera? We have found that we can take uh, leaflet cells up to two to three weeks before, like you would, let's say, a bone marrow, um, just biopsy the patient's own leaflet, and we can grow those cells up. We have plenty of cells in two to three weeks. But how do we actually do this, and what's the timing? And how do you prevent scar formation? As I said, it's a race between recellularization and scar formation. This is, this is huge. How do we define the mechanical engineering performance parameters so that we can predict the material properties? I can tell you as a surgeon when I sew something in that it's a good feel or a bad feel. I can tell you when the aneurysm forms 10 weeks later that this was not a good material. But how do we actually define from an engineering standpoint so that we can predict that behavior after we've used the material in the patient? What are the safety criteria? Uh, as I said, there's a, there was a European study with, bio, with decellularized xenograft material um, that either blew out as aneurysms with rupture formation or became calcific and stenotic very, very rapidly. Obviously, safety, mar safety was not achieved prior to implanting into humans. I do believe that we should be able to rebuild a valve in vitro so that we can understand how to rebuild it in, in vivo. We need to prove that recellularized valve cells express the appropriate phenotype in response to ongoing hemodynamics. That's a proxy for telling you that this valve is going to be still functioning 20 years from now. That's when you look at those homographs and say, why did that one last 20 years? 25 years or even 30 years in some patients and other patients they calcify and are rejected in two to three years. The, uh, I think the, the answer is what happened to the cell biology of that particular valve. But how do we prove that the recellularization of the valve, once it's in vivo, once it's in the patient, whether that patient's a sheep or a human, is actually recellularizing with the proper kind of cells in the proper way so that we can predict the performance of that valve in the patient. It's not as futuristic as you might think to be able to actually do that with, with the kinds of imaging uh, um, equipment that we have now with PET scans, et cetera, we may in fact be able to follow the recellularization. So in a tissue engineered valve, we have various options. We have scaffold options, we have cell options, we have in vitro options, we have in vivo options. We do like the semilunar valve design Potentially, if we solve all these problems in allografts, potentially that could be extended to xenografts if we could get rid of the antigenic protein problem. And the whole question of what minimal processing is prior to transplanting this tissue is an interesting issue. One or two more slides. What are the practical issues from a surgeon's standpoint? I'm going to do this to a patient. How do I get the cells? What's the duration of pre implant pre-implantation preparation. Is this a one-day thing or do I have to have the patient sitting around for three weeks? Is it a breadcrumb approach where we're treating the valve leaflet or is it a hybrid approach where we're treating the valves and seeding the valves? This is huge. Whatever it is that we put in has got to be functional and durable with an appropriate safety margin at the time we implant it, not six months later that the progressive host interaction with the valve must be gradually improving the valve as opposed to degrading the valve as in our current generation of xenografts. 
And, uh, and the valve performance, and, and the corollary to that, is the valve performance over time must be no worse in performance characteristics than the current clinical options. The regulatory issues, we could leave to another discussion. Thank you very much, Be glad to answer any questions. I will say that we have about 40 of these customers sitting around right now with various iterations of the valves put in. I do want to mention one thing. This is why we're doing this. This is a six-year-old boy that came to us with a valve uh, that needed to be replaced. He loved hockey. We were able to put a homograft in him. He's now playing hockey again. This is a picture he sent me of him playing hockey. He's growing. The valve is doing well, but it will need to be replaced probably four or five. I replaced him about four years ago, probably four years from now. He's going to have to go back to surgery for another valve. I'm hoping that the valve we can put in him four years from now will be a permanent uh, recellularized valve. Bob? Thanks, uh, Richard. Uh, we ran a little late, but let's just take a few questions right. while we have this guy here. Uh, let me turn the lights on. Sure. Any questions out there? Anybody want to come work in our lab? <laughs> maybe takers. Uh, what about congenital valvular defects in very small children? Yeah, I think it. What do you do there, and how many surgeries does that person have to look forward to? That's a, real good, that's a real good question. Right now, we're, we're uh, doing hypoplastic left arch, for example, as newborns. Uh, first operation is a phase one operation. They get a phase two operation and a phase three operation. They've had three operations by the age of one. They have a homograph valve in that's functioning, and that homograph valve will have to be replaced two years later, five years after that, 10 years after that. So by the time they're 25 or 30, they're looking at maybe five to seven different operations. So the issue of growth, the ability to put a valve in that will grow with the patient. Right now we use tricks to put in an oversized valve. It's sort of like those old hot rods you used to see where the motor was so big it stuck out the top of the hood. We can, we can do some of that. But if we can actually put a valve in that will grow with the patient, then maybe we only have to do it once. Other questions? No questions. That's that's bad. No questions. Steve, well, you, you talked about um, in, engineering the, the valve and all of the issues, but but what about uh, the host in terms of the blood chemistry? I mean, you mentioned this one lady who who did just fine. And yeah. The next person. You know, that's a real good question. We've really focused on. It was what I think happened with that lady. Is I think that the cadaver was dead just long enough that all the cells were sort of gone. They probably put the, the valve in lactated ringers, which we know strips off endothelium. Probably a lot of good things happened for nobody knew why, but probably when carrying it up from the morgue to the fifth floor operating room, the endothelium stripped off. Most of the myofibroblasts were stunned or dead, and she got basically an amorphous material that did very, very well. But you're absolutely right. Can we alter the host response? There are a number of centers that have talked about, even with the crop preserved homograph, using anti-rejection medications, cyclosporin and particularly steroids. The problem with that is we're now taking a valve that we've all of a sudden decided is less than perfect. We're instituting a clinical treatment to protect this valve from rejection, but the treatment we're giving the patient carries its own risk of infection and problems with cyclosporin and, and prednisone. And if, in fact, you lose a child to bacterial endocarditis or meningitis because they're on anti-rejection, you're going to go, why don't I put a pig valve in? So you, you know, two wrongs don't necessarily make a right in, in, in clinical medicine. There are, having said that, there are current trials. I think there's one in Chicago and there's uh, one in Germany in which patients, children, as, old, as young as neonates, are receiving up to three months of anti-rejection uh, therapy following implantation of a, of a, of a cryopreserved homograph, in other words, one that contains donor cells, with the thought that they're going to prevent this rejection inflammatory response during that period of time that the cells are actually dying. It's possible. Uh, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but you're certainly putting the patient at risk, and if we could just get rid of the antigen and, uh, and implant a valve that's non-antigenic, that 
is more attractive to me? That's a great question, though. Any other? I think, Richard, we're, we're great. at 415. I mean, we should bring it to a hall. If Sounds someone fine. wants to come up and talk to uh, Dr. Hopkins, uh, I'm sure he'd be glad to answer questions. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you.